and welcome to Uninformed Movie Reviews, episode one. Whoa, big applause. Yeah, so David and Frank and Beans, we're, we're shifting gears in 2020. We're shifting gears in the quarantine. We are suspending. We did a podcast. And we're in an, suspended. <laughs> and in its stead, we will have this movie focused podcast, although some of it will seem very familiar if you listen to if you were a wee dapper, a lot of this will seem very, very familiar. That's right. Today we're starting it off episode number one, nice and fresh, with a beautiful Quilm, Quentin and Quarantinoed by Quentin Quarantino. <laughs> did I say that right? I think so. Nice. Uh, we're That's ranking right. the Tarantino movies today. <laughs> That's right. We are going through movie by movie, rank by rank, and discussing our personal choices for Quentin Tarantino's film legacy. Now, this is only films that he's written and directed. True. Great clarification. Yeah. yeah. And even That's a further good. clarification, only feature lengths that he's written and directed. Even better. Because there's there's one that's kind of like weird. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot that are kind of um, weird. <laughs> and t- today we're going to be debating them. So we all prepared our own uh, top 10 list, but we're going to give you a definitive uninformed movie reviews top 10 list by the end of this thing. And Frank, why that's don't you start right. us off? What did you think for 10? All right, here we go, boys. Let's see how we go. And, and you know, just I'm going to go out and say this in front of everything. The hardest part about it is that every movie on this list is a good movie. Like true. none of them are stinkers. Everything was so enjoyable to rewatch again. Like I've had a great like week, week and a half that I've been watching all these movies. Fantastic. Heard the N one a lot though. As my brain, oh, yeah. You know, my brain's a little foggy for my number 10 pick. Got Jackie Brown. You know, that's pretty funny. It's it's I'm close with you there. I'm not quite there, but interesting. I I'm also really close to you. I put my number 10 as death proof. Oh, I, my number 10 is also death proof. And, and I'm I have, surprised. I have to, um, I, I, I gotta be honest though. I, I'm, I'm on the fence about it. There's so many things about death proof that I really, really like. I just think that it has some pacing problems. Yes. And I think that's the same complaint I have with Jackie Brown, mm-hmm. but I, I agree with you, Frank. All the movies are great. Like this is, this was really, really tough to try and decide. Yeah. Like, my goodness. I mean, for me, death proof, like you said, David, I mean, it is a f- fun movie. I just don't think I'll ever watch it again. That's like, mm. it's got a low rewatch value for me, which is weird for all of Quentin Tarantino's movies. I would definitely watch. I've seen more of them, most of them more than once for sure. Mm. And then it's kind of long. It's tedious. Uh, the pacing's kind of weird. Also, just like the the whole tone of Grindhouse itself is just goofy and a little bonkers. And it's kind of not the tone I'm looking for in a Tarantino film. Hmm. So That's so that's- funny. That's... So that's how I feel about Jackie Brown. Some of it, like when I was done watching it, I was like, I mean, yeah, that was enjoyable, but I don't know like when's the next time I'll throw Jackie Brown on. And I haven't seen Jackie Brown in a long time because of that reason. But when I finished watching death proof, that's I was like, Ooh, I'm going to watch that again soon. Really? Oh, you know man. what? I, I got to side with death proof on my rewatch. I kind of have to side with Frank a little bit on this one. Cause when I've only seen death proof, this is the second time I've seen it. And when I finished it the second time, I was like, Oh, that was that was a little delightful. Yeah. Um, when when I rewatched all the Tarantino movies for this uh, podcast, I watched the complete Grindhouse. We watched Planet Terror first. We watched the little trailers that went in between, and then we went ahead and watched uh, Death Proof after it. And I'd never seen Planet Terror. Uh, which, you haven't seen Planet Terror? No, I hadn't seen it until like a couple wow. days ago. Wow! And that I'm movie. Surprised. That movie was punishing. Like that movie was so bad. It's bad. And but you're a zombie fanatic, you know? I know. So I figured like you would have seen Planet Terror. That's crazy. Or at least not checked it off your list. Well, I was even telling Michelle, honestly, I think that is like other than the Resident Evil sequels, <laughs> that is the last big budget zombie movie I've never seen. Like That's a, a really bad one. Like a, a wide release. Yeah. I mean, at least I saved the worst one for last. I mean, I think Resident Evil five is probably maybe worse. I don't know. Uh <laughs> but I, I don't know if we're, if we're doing a definitive, I might change my mind and I might agree with Frank that Jackie Brown's the least about that more when, I mean, I'm just going to spoil it a bit, little bit when I get to my number six, cause that's where I landed for death proof. I enjoyed it. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's intense. Well, and I struggled with that decision a lot, but honestly in my heart of hearts, I think that's where it landed for me. I think for Jackie Brown, the thing that, cause I like the characters. Oh yeah. Um, 
the soundtrack's really good. I just think that they kind of spoiled their own movie by very explicitly and taking a lot of time to explain every aspect of Jackie Brown's plan, where if they had cut a lot of that out and and the audience was unknowing what the, the whole like way they were going to rip him off was, it would be like... Okay, so it would be like if you watched Ocean's Eleven, and in Ocean's Eleven, you know how they deliberately go through every step? <laughs> the montage, the planned then, montage. But then when it happens, everything changes, right? Like n- nothing worked out the way they thought. And that's like the fun part of that movie. Oh no, their plan's messing up. How are they going to get out of it? But in Jackie Brown, it's like they have the Ocean's Eleven montage, and then everything goes exactly as planned. <laughs> so it's like, this is like, weird. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, good job, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Without a stitch, except for Robert De Niro shooting the pretty surfer girl in the stomach. You know what I mean? That's the only thing that kind of went off a of plan. And that that moment feels so like Tarantino, like Tarantino-ish. Yeah. It's like, whoa, what? Because um, this is his third movie, Jackie Brown is, and I think it's his most tame it's like his most reserved. If anything, he was. It felt like he was kind of pulling back a little bit. Yeah. Making more of an like an, an a quote unquote adult movie, uh, very serious. But I just got to say, like I, I love Tarantino's like homage to like Japanese ultraviolence that he puts in like almost everything. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Every gunshot he's got, every dis like every dismembering he has, every maiming. It's like over the top, and. Just like in, in just in all these rewatches, I've just noticed it even more. Just like when, he, when someone gets shot, he makes sure that there's like an explosion of blood somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> that is, is good so outlandish, like <laughs> ridiculous. I think my favorite blood splatter, and I, I took a note of it because I didn't want to forget, is when uh, they shoot one of the slavers in Django at the beginning of the movie. I just saw that. <laughs> head it's ridiculous it's, and then he shoots the horse's head yeah. and it does the same thing the horse's head falls off and he just shoots him with like a revolver too it's not like not like a coach gun or something <laughs> yeah it's pretty ridiculous those exploding bullets man they'll get you <laughs> but speaking of the violence that's one thing about death proof i really loved especially because the movie is split oh, in yeah. half it's like the first half where you think these girls are the main characters but then they really just get killed uh. and then the second half where he's kind of like He's like on the hunt again. Where on we the saying? prowl. He yeah. Out a little bit. We're destroyed. Those first set of girls. Like, yeah. That's are so when, good. When that lady's leg is outside the window. Yes, <laughs> dude. That's yes. so good. When it's jiggling on the ground, when it hits. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, the, the, the tire that like runs over that girl's Oh, face. yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, that part. See, that's the best like, part of the movie for me. Was just like, okay, whoa, where did this come from in this movie? It just. Ooh, that second half, I love so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the only thing about Death Proof, and it would be way up higher on my list. I think Death Proof is kind of like a slasher movie, except the villain is yeah. is a car and like a driver, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the first half of the movie, Kurt Russell is one of the coolest Tarantino characters. He's like mysterious. And then the whole thing about the lap dance on the radio, that whole like shtick, and him like convincing this girl more or less. It's like a really cool Kurt Russell performance. Um and in the second half, when he finds out that he's like in danger, he turns into this like bubbling crybaby, which oh yeah, which I think is cool. I think Tarantino is kind of speaking to like the nature of predators, yeah, in that they boast themselves, but when they're put in the corner, they're really weak people. Um, the only thing I wish is that the first half of the movie was paced a little bit quicker, more mm. like a, yeah, more that's... like a Friday the Thirteenth kind of thing. Like we needed yeah. to see Kurt Russell kill like three or four different sets of girls. Yeah. Like quickly. Yeah. They spent so he, much time and then it, it feels like the movie just restarts and it's like, it seems uh, like they're depending so much on the initial shock of the actual first kill mm-hmm. that they, you know, they build up too long on it. And that, that was my problem. It was just too long and tedious in the beginning. I'm just like, Oh my God, when is something going to happen? You know? And they, they should have cut out Dominique de Coco and Eli <laughs> Roth. They're in that movie for like, 20 minutes and that, that scene just didn't need to happen yeah those hey man were- eli roth needed a paycheck okay <laughs> <laughs> what were you gonna say frank sorry i think i think you cut oh, out a little bit oh sorry i was saying uh those characters were definitely in that first half way too much yeah i think so i mean imagine if like somehow they summed up that first scene or even told it a little bit out of like i mean tarantino tells things out of order all the time it could have like started off with those girls driving their car at night you know what i mean and then you see Kurt Russell like drive up 
turn around, turn the lights off, and then that crash, and then all the all you know disgusting stuff, and then it's like boom, title card, death proof. And then after that, go back in time and then show like a little intro about that, about how he like lured him in. And then cut to another thing like to, like him stalking them. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the, him like mm, look at those ladies over there. Ooh, I and got picked up right here. The only thing I could think of is like if you watch Death Proof if you watch Grindhouse in theaters, at that point you were already like you'd watch two hours of movie and it was an awful movie to begin with. We went. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Frank it was we Frank did. and I that went. Yeah, we went to go see it. I was it. like, oh, I saw it. And we sat through that. Whole- <laughs> well, we I'm sat through Planet Terror. I'm not going to be watching Planet Terror again because I know already. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I wish I would have been able to see that. That would have been a cool cinematic experience. I think, cool that being said, also, it, it's like it kind of made me realize that I wish there was more Kurt Russell in Tarantino movies because I, in Hateful Eight, he's not the best role i feel like this is his best role in the tarantino movie i feel like his role in in hateful eight is kind of not that great but really i love i'd love to see him in another one he should he should come back though for sure um okay so let's let's put down a definitive 10 i mean i'm down to go with jackie brown because i was on the fence and frank talking about death proof like it it made butterflies fly up in my stomach i could i could say there's considerably more things i liked about death proof than jackie brown Cool. And I just want to shout out to you in this movie, we get two different feet shots. So we got a Tarantino, a Tarantino trademark. We also get an inverse of the trunk shot when they're shopping for that car, they get an under the hood shot. So instead of looking in the trunk, they're looking at the engine of the car. I thought that was really cool. Are there any end bombs? Ooh, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think, think there's an end bomb in that entire I don't think movie. there's any black people in this movie, to be honest. <laughs> I, I think it's one of the only all white Tarantino movies. Um, it's also, and I was telling Michelle, I thought it was kind of interesting. Tarantino has strong female characters, but Death Proof might be the only movie that it's a group of girls having a conversation with no guys. Did you say Death Proof was an all white movie? I think it is, isn't it? There's oh, one black no. girl, isn't there? There's two, actually, in the beginning. Oh. There's a, there's a black girl in the first group. There's a black girl in the second group. I totally forgot that. It's just because you don't see color, David. That's what it is. And that's good. <laughs> but we are going with number 10, Jackie Brown. I feel solid about that. Okay. Yep. Let's move on. Danny, you want to you wanna lead us in? What's your number nine? Ooh, well, my number nine was Jackie Brown. So. <laughs> <laughs> and your number 10 was Death Proof. So I'm, and I'm my guessing. number 10 was Death Proof. So should we just... Mosey on to the next one. You know what? I'm going to be honest. What was your nine, David? My nine was Jackie Brown and my 10 was Death Proof. Hmm. So I'm actually kind of down to put Death Proof at number nine because it feels like there's two of us on the same. uh, I know it's a lot higher on Frank's, but. You know what? I I feel okay with that. I'll concede because like I said, every movie on this list is a winner. They're all all winners. They're They're all all watchable. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I loved about it. It's just like putting it on and being like, this isn't tedious at first like every every tarantino movie has a great intro at the very least mm. to be said you know what i mean yeah. oh and excellent music oh yeah um the the jack jackie brown's use of delphonics is just like beautiful um and i was so excited to hear some of that music again Oof. um okay so i feel like we're gonna get hate for the jackie brown being a 10 but we have jackie brown at 10 death proof <laughs> at nine and then i'll lead with my number eight i put kill bill volume two Oh, interesting. Because I, I, I love Kill Bill, and I think if we had ranked them as Kill Bill, the whole bloody affair, like just one event, it might have been higher. But I think Kill Bill 2, um, I don't think it's that interesting on its own. No. Like, even in contrast to Kill Bill 1, it's a lot slower of a movie. Um, and I think that's what a lot of the charm in Kill Bill is, just how off the wall um, I mean, of course, there's still awesome stuff in Volume Two. It's not bad by any means. I think it um, loses its steam for sure it, from yeah, the first one. It, it does feel like it loses a little bit of steam. Um, what did you guys have for eight? Mine is Hateful Eight, <laughs> <laughs> number eight. Uh, I, yeah. Um, I mean, so for eight, I had Reservoir Dogs just because that's oh, where. Oh man! And it's crazy because I have a lot of nostalgia for Reservoir Dogs, but Ooh. I also had. Pulp Fiction for my nine. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, 
Controversial. Okay, so, that is a hot take. I know. That is a like, hot take. Oof. Paul, I mean, it's much higher. I'll just say that on mine. And honestly, I was thinking about it, and part of it might just be because I've seen it just so many times. <laughs> it might just be like on my rewatch out of all these movies, I think that's the movie I've seen the most. <laughs> and that's I, why I didn't enjoy it as much as some of the others this time around. That's a fair point. I think I want to save our conversation for Pulp Fiction because it's going to be higher on the list. Yeah. But I, I was expecting that. And that's yeah. where it landed for me this time. Really weird. Hmm. So what do we have at number eight on your guys's? I, I have Hateful Eight. You have Kill Bill Volume 2. I have Reservoir Dogs. That's oh just so God. surprising. That's like... <laughs> this is a surprising no. one. <laughs> I know. I struggled with this so much. I was like, Reservoir Dogs is obviously number one. You know what I mean? That's like, as soon as we had said this, I was like, oh, well, Reservoir Dogs is first. I mean, it, it's not on my list. It changed a little bit. But that was my gut instinct. Uh, I know what you mean. That, though. Was, that was never my gut instinct. Like, but I like Reservoir Dogs. I saw after, man, starting with Inglorious Bastards, I've seen all of them in theaters. And like Django, I hadn't really revisited that much. But when I saw it again... I was like, man, this movie's delightful. Amazing. This is a great movie. Um, so I know what you mean, Frank. There's a lot of like re exploration, like opening yeah. up. It was like finding a toy when you're like 12 years old and you find some toy that you had when you were eight. And you're like, what? Yeah. It's like buying an N64 oh. again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's I, cool. I mean, uh, Frank, I mean, yeah, I'm just, I'm surprised. I didn't think that it would be that low for you. Yes, yeah. I, I honestly. I mean, the cast is amazing. Coming into this, I definitely would have expected it landing like both of those movies landing a lot higher in my list. Um, but same thing with Reservoir Dogs. I mean, I've seen Reservoir Dogs at this point like at least a dozen times, maybe dozens. Um, it's something our dear friend Jake like introduced me to when we were young, and that's always carried like a, a big nostalgia for me. And due to that fact, I've watched that movie countless times. My goodness. Yeah. Um, I'd say that. Might just be a little bit played out. And fantastic. Um, every bit of the plot, everybody acts their entire butt off. Oh, yeah. Um, and I enjoyed it so much. Like, I texted you guys in the middle of it. Just like, guys, he hearing Tim Roth's, like, dying voice <laughs> is so dope. Like, this it's is so iconic. It's, it's, it's got a lot of iconic moments in that movie. Oh, I yeah. mean, but... And that, that blur shot, you know, that classic half cut blur shot. Yeah. Tarantino shot. And he uses that a, like a whole bunch. He uses All it so many bunch. times. Yeah. Just the dialogue in that movie is incredible in Reservoir Dogs. But like you got to, I mean, I don't know. It's, um, it's one of the, uh, save for Jackie Brown. Those are the two movies that I did not see in theaters for Tarantino. One, because it was earlier than I could. Because you're yeah. like two years old. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't have seen it. But There's like that's movie for everybody else. That's one that I I had experienced. Well, I guess the same with Pulp Fiction. I couldn't have seen it anyway. But those are the ones that I had to revisit through VHS and through HBO and all that to like really live out. And those are like very nostalgic for me. So that's really interesting that it's that low. Yeah, Reservoir Dogs is the first one I saw, and I've seen that movie. It feels like a hundred times. I feel like I know the whole script. You know what I mean? Um, but the one thing about Reservoir Dogs, no matter how many times I watch it, you, I feel like you got to think back to the first time you watch Reservoir Dogs and like when the twists start hitting, you know what I yeah. mean? Because that movie just feels like so unbelievable when you're watching it. Like what? And, and to think of like <laughs> how much money they made it on, like it's like a shoestring budget, like a definition of a shoestring budget. It's like three sets. It's pretty yeah. crazy. Well, and then it's also got that that kind of charm that like early mobster movies kind of have. You know what I mean? Like it's got the same kind of charm that like Casino has for me. Yeah. Okay. And which like if it's on in the middle of the day, I'll probably just like take a nap, but then watch it in between, you know, because it's <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. And I wake up at any point and it's like, oh, I remember what happened. <laughs> oh, this is a great scene. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's about to chop his ear off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. Okay. So it comes <laughs> It's like, oh, that dance. It's about to go down. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we're going to have to come to some kind of consensus. And I'm sorry. We're Frank, all over the place. What did, have, have, what did you guys have for your eights again? Okay. Hateful so eight. I have Kill Bill volume two. Now I will say that my Kill Bill is close to your David's. Hmm. I'm going to say my hateful eight landed way off of Danny's. Okay. 
Mine, know, mine's very... also a little bit higher too. My kill bill or my hateful eight's a little bit higher than. So mine should be out of the consensus. So are you guys all comfortable with going Kill Bill Volume Two? I, I could say so. I agree with your arguments about Kill Bill Volume Two. I will say that I, I do have Volume One ranked higher than Volume Two on my list. Yeah, I think you have to. Yeah, I think it'd be weird not to really. I just have a question, and I can't remember. <laughs> I have, I have a question I can't remember. As far as Kill Bill goes, which which version, which volume had the amazing anime sequences? Was that volume First two? Ah, uh, well, then, yeah, let's put Kill Bill down there. <laughs> volume <Yeah>. two. <laughs> to, to refresh your memory. Uh, anime argument. <laughs> <laughs> volume two is the one where she kills Bud. Like, she goes to his trailer to kill him, but um, L... He's really best with a bunch of... Rock salt. Rock salt. Yeah, she gets buried yeah. alive. Um, she, there's the whole flashback about her training with Pai Mei, who actually was going to be played by Tarantino, and they were going to dub him like it was a kung fu movie. That's hilarious. I'm so glad that didn't happen. And that's the only movie that he's not in, which I thought was interesting. So they had a role plan for him, and then they they took him out of it, which is good. <laughs> then, yeah. yeah right. Some, right, cool. And then we get the fight with L, where she – plucks out the eyeball and um, just to just in ca- just in case she finds it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then we also i don't know if you remember this but in the first movie we don't know that bill was like in a relationship with her like the reveal at the end is like let bill or well we get the thing right at the beginning where she says it's your daughter bill but we don't know what their like relationship is like that doesn't happen until volume two it's all through flashbacks and then we also get the stuff where she goes to like that Mexican brothel and then she goes to Bill's house and then they have a whole conversation like that, that the last part of it really drags for me, but um, yeah, it slows down at the end. Yeah. 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 It's weird. The whole, and if you look at the whole thing, both movies, it's like shoots up super high and then it's a slow ride down. It's like a really weird uh, structure, I guess. I was like the volume two starts, right? I haven't seen a ton. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know, but maybe. Um, so, all right. Number seven, then everyone, um, who's, I think it's Frank. What did you have for your number seven? All right, guys. Then this is one of the picks that I made that, and, and I feel like I'm going to say this over and over again, but it's going to cause a little bit of controversy here. So buckle in, hold on to your butts. I have once upon a time in Hollywood. Hey, that's mine. (sighs) <sighs> that's also mine 777 hey! so much hey. honestly like it's good something it's about good. it doesn't grab me the way a lot of Tarantino movies grab me I feel like this is a dumb comment to say about a Tarantino movie but it's too long <laughs> it's, that is that's that's a dumb uninformed opinion <laughs> that is an uninformed opinion for sure and I, <laughs> um, but I mean honestly it's just it just drags there's like a mid movie dip for a minute it, it kind of has a lot, like some red herrings in it that kind of don't go anywhere, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. And it's just, uh, stylistically, it's the least... I mean, it's cool. The cinematography is amazing. The fact that there was so much uh, effort put into recreating old Hollywood, it was amazing. Yeah. But it was a lot of a hype monster for me. I, I really like it. I think, I think the Charlie Manson thing is weird. That I feel like when it was advertised, it was so much like, oh, uh, Tarantino's making a movie and it's going to involve the Manson murders. And I went in, maybe I shouldn't have gone in with that expectation, but you see Charlie Manson for like three minutes and the movie really has nothing to do with him. Nope. It was um, a small cameo for a small man. Yeah. <laughs> what they should have said was like, oh, this is a movie about Hollywood. This is a movie about old yeah. Hollywood. Oh, and it happened to take place at the same time where Marilyn Manson was running around being crazy. Well, Charles Manson. Charles Manson. Marilyn was probably there too. But yeah. wait, which one's which one's Charles Manson? <laughs> the one with all his ribs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow. That's the thing I always have trouble remembering. Thank you, guys. I'm gonna write that down somewhere. Shout out to all the millennial middle schoolers. <laughs> um, wow. Um, there's something else I wanted. To, oh, you know what? I I agree. I like. I'm someone who enjoys a slow, long movie. I, but I totally understand when someone says this movie's too long. Um, and it, it feels its length, I think. Um, but I thought it was interesting when I was reading into this, when they first turned in the first edit of the movie, it was four hours long. Oh, that, my. that doesn't surprise me. And then they were like, we got to cut this down. But apparently they cut out a bunch of really good stuff. And there's talks about 
later this year releasing a four hour long cut of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, well, I wonder if they'll do it like the Hateful Eight and like a mini series on Netflix or something. That would be cool. That'd be smart. That'd be really smart. Um, but I thought just one thing I wanted to toss out here. I feel like this is one of the first just straight comedies. I feel like a lot of it is yeah. played like a comedy, especially Leo's like breakdown and like his midlife crisis. Oh, but um, it's another Tarantino movie that's unique in that the stakes aren't high in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's really like, it's about this guy's climb back to fame and like reveling in old Hollywood and a little bit about what Hollywood did to people, but there's no real, like, if I don't do this, like my family's going to die, or this is like a life and death situation. Not until the very end. <laughs> Not until the end, really. <laughs> that situation. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would have to say, I think it's the only Tarantino movie that doesn't have like a major plot device. Like, I totally agree with you, Danny. All the rest of them, they have some point, some goal they're trying to achieve. Whereas in this one, it feels like we're just following around characters and seeing what they're up to. Um, and then we get some goofy backstories about some of them. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> I would say the saving grace of this movie for me was the relationship between DiCaprio and Pitts. Like, oh, yeah. That's just the movie. That's like mm -hmm. what sells it. And it's what maintains the flow of the movie for sure. And I also just love like when Brad Pitt visits that hippie farm, you know what I mean? And they're all, they're all like freaking out. And then when that guy slashes his tire and everything, like, <laughs> there's some great stuff there from Brad Pitt. I, I do agree with some of the criticism the movie got though. I think that Margot Robbie's like really underutilized. She, she she's made a fantastic, fantastic yeah. actress. Yeah, she really is. Yeah. They and didn't use her for much. She's, she's got maybe 15 lines. Um, they just have her as like Sharon Tate. That's it. Like, yeah. Mean, she's just Sharon Tate. And then in an interview, Tarantino is trying to talk about how it's supposed to be like her goodness, like Sharon Tate's goodness is it's like a, you know, symbolism in the movie, but I don't know, man, when she's not involved with any of the plot, except for the last like 15 minutes, I feel like that doesn't really matter. It's not like she was having any effect on the other characters in the movie. It's so, true. That lost I, me a little bit. I think something that kind of is a little bit of the saving grace also is that in classic Tarantino fashion, he definitely does the uh, the twist of, of uh, nonfiction that like mm. kind of keeps you going, you know what I mean? With like Hollywood nonfiction with like the whole Roman Polanski thing and with Sharon Tate and with DiCaprio being a part of it and then the Bruce Lee fight. Oh, my <laughs> it's like fight's so fantastic. I think, and that's like a new trademark of Tarantino. That's like something that's kind of like revisionist history, but he's been super into it lately. He loves um, it. I, lo I love it too. I think it's, it's like, it's fun. It's a bold it's choice. Man. Well, that's really the only thing in the movie that really pays off at the end because we all knew what happens to Sharon Tate going into the movie. So you're watching it and you see these like scenes of Sharon Tate, like, watching a movie with her dirty feet like who takes her shoes off in a movie theater is yeah. disgusting um and she's all having a good time she's happy and everything and it's like uh, croy i hear boy <laughs> the croy y'all heard nothing <laughs> but the sound of a lacroix <laughs> i feel like the whole point of it is the tension going through the movie you yeah. know what i mean like you're waiting you're like oh no this is gonna be terrible they're gonna murder this pregnant lady right now boom he throw he flips it around on you so I appreciate that. Well, let's, let's do six. That's cool that we had one we all lined up on. It was very exciting. And then for, well, what did you have for six, Danny? For six, I had Kill Bill Volume 2. Ooh, okay. Yeah. And it, like all of the points we said, I totally resonate with Kill Bill Volume 2. It is the lesser of the, of the Kill Bills. So um, which one have we skipped that's over? Interesting. That was... um. Uh, that's only one off for me. Like I have uh, Kill Bill Volume Two on the next slot, so it's oh, very. Five. Okay. Uh, what about you, David? Five, six is where I had Death Proof. Oh, oh, that's Ooh. right. Uh, six. I have Hateful Eight. Hmm. Ba -na 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 I guess I. F yeah. Na -na 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 -na. Sorry. I feel like theory. let's get let's get into Hateful Eight. I mean, this seems like an appropriate yeah, like, time because I still have Hateful Eight. A, 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 like a little good bit higher than this huh interesting okay yeah. <laughs> um well first off i just want to throw this out and it's a hypothesis but i bet it's right i was like danny probably doesn't like this movie that much compared to a bunch of the other ones but it's also funny because i feel like this is the most danny movie on the list i don't think you agree with me but i'm gonna try and convince you um 
Are you going to sell Hateful Eight to Danny right now? It's literally the thing with Cowboys, even down to Kurt Russell being in it. It's a movie about deception. It's a movie about not knowing who's really who. Um, it, it takes place all in that one little thing to really build the tension up. Then Ennio Morricone busts out uh, just maybe the most intense film score. The only scored film in this whole list. Mm-hmm. Everything else is sampled. Or like the Morricone that's in Inglorious Bastards or Django, it's taken from older movies. Nothing was originally written. Um, but in the last scenes of this movie... And spoiler alert, right before Joe Gage gets shot, who's played by Michael Madsen, the music in that scene is from The Thing. And it's like Ennio Morricone's score from The Thing. And they snuck it in the movie. And you would never notice because they sound exactly the same. It's crazy. That Um, is crazy. But Hateful Eight for me is the one that jumped the most. When I left the theater, I was like, okay, that was good. That was a good time. But I've, I have I watched it twice because I watched the theatrical version and I watched the extended cut on Netflix. Um, and man, all the little details, all the character performances, those beautiful giant panoramic shots that they get, which literally it's only been done like it, – it's called Ultra Panavision and they've only done it for like three or four movies or something like that. That's wow. insane. I did not know that. And, and one of them has been her. So it's like, it's, wow, this was definitely more enjoyable than Ben Hur. I'll tell you, <laughs> it's just a little bit shorter than Ben Hur. <laughs> that, that's another Jake movie, isn't it? Isn't that another movie Jake? Hey, ben Hur is awesome. Yeah, I don't know if that's a movie Jake enjoys. He just proposed that we watch it one time, but it was like three o'clock in the morning, so we immediately <laughs> fell asleep. <laughs> that's a bad idea. That's yeah. a two VHSer, man. Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> three, if you want those special features. Um, <laughs> what do you guys think about Hateful Eight? I I think it's it's an amazing movie. I love like the fact that the whole cinematography looks like it's straight out of Red Dead Redemption is like another selling point for me. I think it's an awesome movie. I've seen it two, I want to say three times. And I like you said, the rewatch was better than the initial experience for me. I think so. Because I did know what was going to happen, but then I also had more time to focus on the small details in between. I hadn't thought about the analogy of it being the thing. Well, I mean, it's not even an analogy. It's like essentially what it is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. And I did love, there are a lot of one shots, which is amazing. And it's essentially one, three sets, maybe four sets yeah. in the entire movie. Two, I think it's like the inside of the carriage, the cabin, the cabin, and the then bar. outside. Yeah. And outside of like the, the shed, yeah. maybe. which I think you could argue still counts as the cabin. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. the set. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. And it does play out a lot. Like it's like a, yeah. Like a classic who done it, who done kind of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it does play out well. There's a little bit of goofiness in it too, but it is also dialogue heavy and great. The cast is what saves it. The cast is amazing. For sure. Yeah, the cast is fantastic. One of the things I love so much about the movie is the tension that it just, it's almost stressful to watch. You know what I mean? The, the tension just rises through the whole thing, even on my rewatches. Um, the details, fantastic. And I love, I might not love all the characters because some of them are there to be unlikable because they're highly unlikable because mm-hmm. they're still super racist because they think the South will <laughs> That's very racist. It was a different time. (laughs) Um, But I love what they do to the ensemble. You know what I mean? Everybody plays like a really solid part in the dynamic inside that haberdashery. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Bob, Bob is fantastic. I love Bob. I love that coat too. I want one of those. Not great for the hot weather we have down here in El Paso, but I feel like that thing's super comfy. Isn't he the Mexican cartel dealer in uh, in Weeds? Mm. The one that Nancy ends up marrying, who's like a politician, but he's also like a yeah, mayor like of uh, of uh, Tijuana. Yeah, 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 yeah. that I'm is. Pretty him. sure that's him. Um, yep. I really like Walter Goggins' performance, man. Walter Goggins is an amazing yeah. actor, <laughs> and and I think Tarantino says something really interesting about racism in this movie, like because Walter Goggins is just straight up racist for most of it. But then, like him and Samuel L. Jackson end up being the only guys that can really like count on each other. Yeah, um, I say I, I think one nitpick is that I think it's Walton Goggins. Is it Walton Goggins? Really? I think it is Walton Goggins. It could be. I. You know what? I've like only seen a couple movies with that guy. I, didn't, I never watched Justified or anything like that. Oh, 
which I know he's, he's also in Righteous Gemstones and he kills it, my uh, guy. See, I still haven't <laughs> seen Righteous yeah. Gemstones either. Sons of Anarchy, y'all. Sons of Anarchy yeah. also. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. He's that's an incredible I mean. actor. That's where I saw him first. It is Walt. It's Walton, Ooh, that's right? Good to know. Okay. Walton Goggins. Sorry about that, Mr. Goggins. It's Walton uh, Loglins, actually. Oh, what, Loglins. A, what a goofy name. What else are out on in there? <laughs> They were like, this boy's going to have a tough time with Goggins going his he's, whole life. <laughs> he's got a name that sounds like he owns a candy shop. Let's name him Walton. <laughs> it does. Walton Goggins Sweetery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I, I, also, I, there's so many great Samuel Jackson performances. Yes. This might be my favorite, man. Dude, it's he, so good. Dude, he's, I don't know. I don't know. This isn't my favorite Samuel Jackson performance. Oh, okay. I was just saying, is it Mace Windu? Is that what you're? I might agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was think just what you're gonna say, and I also think I agree with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the 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 tale that he spins to Bruce Dern about his son. It's just amazing. Like, oh, it's it's so powerfully intense. Yeah, um, that monologue. He just gets so forceful with his words and his laughter. And then Bruce Dern knows, like he realizes, like. Oh, this is a real story. Can we He's just not making this up? Can we acknowledge that, like, in the continuity of our podcast, that Samuel L. Jackson kind of falls under the same camp as like Ben Kingsley, and that they are amazing actors, but they take a lot of. Excuse me, one second, guys. Stick work, man. Yeah, Samuel L. Jackson. He's he's been in classics because he does everything. Exactly. He won't say no. He does That's it all. For sure. <laughs> yeah, like. Well, and I, I didn't know this, but his first movie was Goodfellas, and he was already like in his 30s when he started being an actor. That's so crazy. I guess he felt like he had to make up for lost time, so he just was like, let me do a mall. Also another man that doesn't really age. Yeah, he really doesn't. Unless when they do it in, on purpose in a movie like Captain Marvel or... Uh, Ugh. Or, uh, well, uh, in Django Unchained, they, they really make him up. They do. Up him up. But I mean, it's better. It's easier to make Samuel L. Jackson look old than it is to make him look young. I'd say. Yeah, Cap- Captain Marvel. That's my least favorite Samuel L. Jackson. Performance. That's also a terrible movie. Yeah, I don't like that movie at all. <laughs> okay, <laughs> why so- didn't we bring that up last podcast? We said, "Oh, that's the worst movie in the MCU." We forgot about Captain Marvel. <laughs> Captain Marvel's so bad that I've blocked it out of my memory. <laughs> Such that's- a terrible experience. That's like the only one I actively hate. I'll put up with all the other ones. <laughs> That one I just don't like. Um, so wait, what are we doing for six? Are we doing Hateful Eight or does anyone have an, another argument? I know it's higher on Frank. Oh, Frank, list. yeah. Is there something you'd like to pitch for six? What do you have there? Frank is thinking. He's touching his nose. Because we already ranked Kill Bill Volume 2. It is lower on the list currently. I do know that. It's number eight. Yes, sir. And I feel like my arguments for Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs are going to be beaten because my whole thing was just like oversaturation, I think. Mm. You know what I mean? Which isn't a great reason to rank something so great so low, but that's just how I felt about it. My, I'm, a, I, I, <sighs> I'm not I, comfortable putting Hateful Eight here. I did enjoy it way more than six, I think. Hmm. I, I could live with moving Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction down a little bit, but I couldn't put either of them at six. At six, uh, no, yeah, that's too low. And that's what I was, and that's what I was thinking right now is like, I, now's not my time to make my argument for those movies because there's no way these guys have those movies ranked this low. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's what we should ask, Danny. Out of the movies that we have left, which one would you put at number six? Or, Kill Bill or Volume One? Interesting. So you'd be comfortable with putting Hateful Eight above Kill Bill? Yeah, I'd say I enjoyed it more than Kill Bill. I'm okay with that because I definitely enjoyed Hateful Eight more than Kill Bill. I'll do it, man. I'm a, I'm a crazy man. Okay, so <laughs> number six, we're going to put Kill Bill Volume 1. Somebody stop him. <laughs> wow. Um, this is a crazy list so far. Kill, Kill Bill, I had actually had at five. It was my next one. Um, which I really like Kill Bill. I think it's like an epic story. I think it's most of ours like... Like, I'm sure we all watched Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction, but Kill Bill was, like, the turning point for Tarantino. Yeah. He kind of He's like it. a new age Tarantino. Yeah. It, everything was, like, hyper-violenced. Because it's always been cool and stylized. That's always been his thing. Um, I feel like this was more so 
kind of like a, a case study on like what he grew up watching because he, he mm-hmm. did watch like a bunch of spaghetti westerns and old kung fu movies too right and he always wanted to make an old kung fu movie and, and that's, that's kind of what this is that's pretty much yeah and, and there, that's a lot of his thinking behind the movies that he makes uh like he'll kind of take a genre or subgenre that he's been super into and then cram all these references to other films and famous scenes from other movies that are in the same genre and kind of create this weird, you know, soup that is Tarantino movies. Um, but yeah, Kill Bill, Kill Bill is the, the, uh, Kung Fu one for sure. It's, yeah. it's definitely the Kung Fu movie. Yeah. I mean, how it's memorable. It? Like it's super yeah. iconic and yeah. memorable. And like, it's like the point where like, it's, I mean, most of these movies, but you know what I mean? Watching it, I was giddy at the anticipation of the scenes that I knew that were coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Dude, that like, I don't want to whistle it into the microphone because it's going to be sharp. Yeah, it's great. I mean, the the Lucy Liu, right? And then then, um, uh, Uma Thurman, I mean, they're all incredible in it. David Carradine, R.I.P. is also in it. And um, always have a spotter, kids. Yeah, always have a spotter if you're going to autoerotic asphyxiate yourself. Oh my gosh, I um was reading that Kill Bill Volume One. The people who the the what would you call it? The martial arts expert on set, the one who's teaching everyone, mm-hmm. is the guy who did consultant. Thank you. Is the guy who did Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and oh the yeah. Movies. Um, so that is it, like, Ang Lee. I don't. I don't think it's angle. That's like, it's not just a director. Oh, it was a director. Okay. Yeah. Not all Asian people know kung fu. Well, I thought they would not direct not. and <laughs> and consult. <laughs> uh, it's also the guy who did the the um, the uh, consulting on Kung Pao. Um, that's a joke. That one's not real. <laughs> I was like, that's amazing. Interesting. <laughs> I just imagine this very serious kung fu dude just being like. Guys are a bunch of clowns. <laughs> I will say that Kung Pao is worth the CLE sometime soon. Oh, that's actually that that might one be. of the best. Kung Pao is worth a CLE and a rewatch, and I mean, you can like get a poster of it in your room. That movie is. I love me Kung Pao. <laughs> that is a fun. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good one. Um, I'm down to do that. We should write that. I'm, I'm going to write that down right now. Um, what was I going to say about Kill Bill, though? Uh, oh, I just got to say, man, Uma Thurman just tosses so much sass. She's just so, she's so vengeful. She's just so driven by blood and lust. And I love it. Every time she gets to talk to one of these people, she's going to kill. She's just like monstrous and it's great. The original scene at the church in Mexico, I think in the beginning of Um, one, it is supposed to be El Paso, right? It's supposed to be in El Paso. Fun fact. Did you air quote Mexico? (laughs) Yeah. Cause I thought it was supposed to be like Mexico. No, it's supposed to be El Paso, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's also, also like really anywhere in El Paso. El Paso is also mentioned at the beginning of Django Unchained, I will say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also mentioned in Reservoir Dogs. There's like a bunch of shout outs to El Paso. It's really weird. Um, and uh, it was filmed in El Paso, Kill Bill. It was filmed uh, out that's by right. Cattlemen's. Uh, out by Cattlemen's, they have that spot that they rent out to. And that's why it looks like it's in the middle oh, of right. nowhere because it really is. Yeah, <laughs> but hey, that's those are some great steaks, man. Yeah, to some really good steaks, and a <laughs> steak you can eat only moments after looking a cow in the eye, and <laughs> you can go pet them and then be like, "Wow, these are very tasty." Yeah. <laughs> Trigger warning for all the vegans. Right here, Wham. <laughs> Brandon is crying right now. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> but oh. yeah, uh, actually, funny you say that. Kill Bill is my number five. Okay, well, let's put Kill Bill Volume 1 at number 6. I think we're all set there. Um, let's go to number 5. Frank, what did you have at number 5? So you number 5, I had Kill Bill Volume 2 because my lists are very different from you guys. And I've been thinking about this while we were discussing the last slot. Because I think this is the point where I'd be okay conceding Hateful Eight because we haven't landed it yet, right? We have not. And honestly... And I think this is where it's going to land on the ultimate. I, I don't know if I'd be any more comfortable moving it further up because I do love Hateful Eight, but not as much as some of these other movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's the most controversial thing, man, because Hateful Eight is is like not the one that people love. 
No. And it it the- wasn't even the original movie itself, right? He changed it. Well, I actually... I did, the, uh, oh, sorry. tell us. You know what I mean? I did a little <laughs> bit of research about this. Hit us with um, it. Yeah, so someone had leaked the script to Hateful Eight, and Tarantino was so upset that someone would spoil the movie-going experience. So he said, hey, we're going to uh, have a one-night live stage reading. And after that, no one is going to hear the original script again. Although it's probably on the internet somewhere if it was leaked. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, but you don't have to read it. You can't hear it. You can't <laughs> yeah. hear your words on a screen, David. <laughs> um, so the the live set reading was the entire cast, all the actual actors, except for the person who played Daisy Domergue, Dom, Dom, Domergue and um, uh, Channing Tatum, who plays Domergue's brother, um, they were replaced by two other actors and I'm, I'm, I always forget his name, but, uh, Channing Tatum was played by the guy who's Dexter's dad. Oh, Michael something. Uh, wait, I don't know. He's also in Django. He's He's also the guy that gets his head exploded. Yeah. He's like his number two or something. And he's also in the warriors. He's Ajax who gets cuffed to that bench, which is weird because the girl in the warriors, she looks so much like the girl in death proof. The one who's huh. who gives the lap dance, and I just kept thinking that that whole movie. I was like, <laughs> just like the girl from the Warriors. That's impossible. It's been like twenty years. Anyway, um, so they did the live stage performance, and then I found a review of it that someone had written online. He's like a film critic who went who was reviewing Hateful Eight the movie, but then just so happened to have seen that live stage performance. It was only one performance of, and he Gosh. said that. The entire movie is exactly the same except for the final act, the last, like, 20 minutes of the movie. And basically, the big difference is is that they shoot Domergue and that um, Goggins bleeds out. And that's, like, mm. the end of the movie. Everyone is just there dead. The so, ending, that's way more satisfying. Yeah, I'm, ac- I'm actually glad this got leaked because his second go-around, the ending's way better. We get the scene of him reading the Lincoln letter. Um, with uh, old Mary Todd's calling. Yeah. So I guess I should get to nice bed. Touch. Nice touch. <laughs> yeah, that's such a cool leveling moment. Where For that scene, he's like, you know what? I've given you all this racial hatred this whole movie, but, you know, we're good guys, and, like, we've we've connected. You know what I mean? There's There's some doors being opened there. But then also just, like, them hanging her at the end. Because, you know, you only got to hang mean bastards. But, but mean me- bastards got to hang thank you <laughs> um that's very more, interesting yeah i think i think it's cool how it ended up and then one other thing i watched the extended cut i don't know if you guys have i haven't um i haven't yet but i enjoyed it so much i was like i'm watching the extended cut this week i'm gonna start it knock that thing out on on netflix it's split up into four parts it's about maybe that's 20, genius yeah it's maybe like 20 more minutes of footage um i gotta say it's nothing groundbreaking. There's some cool scenes that add a few more little things. And and not to spoil the whole thing, but we know that like in Hateful Eight, those people really killed the owners. They killed many and everyone who was there. And one of them was plucking a chicken. Well, in the extended cut, Kurt Russell like sees that chicken half plucked. And it's instantly like, what's going on here? And so there's like a whole little thing about the chicken. Um, other than that, most of it's more or less the same. There's a couple extra little lines of dialogue. Um, I prefer the theatrical cut just because it's not interrupted because they, they have to end the episode, but it's a movie. So it, it doesn't feel like, you know, it doesn't feel like a TV show. Right. It feels like, oh, it's a commercial break and I got to wait for it to come back on or something. Do they recap it before the episode starts? No, they don't. But they play the intro every time. Oh, goodness. Hmm. Yeah, That's kind of tiresome. Yeah, it pads the runtime, too. So if you like look at the runtime side by side, it's like, whoa, this is like 40 minutes longer. You know what I mean? But then it's like, oh, but there's that four-minute intro at the beginning of every episode. So that's 12 minutes right there that have just been oh, God. eaten up. Not to mention ending credits that they add in, too. So it's a little weird. Um, but it's worth the experiment, I think. I think it's worth checking out once. We're um, all about experimenting here. On yeah, David and so that's what we do here at Uninformed Movie Reviews. Mm-hmm. Um, what's number four, y'all? Uh, should I? Go for it, Danny. Please do. Django! Django! Django, Django Unchained. Django Unchained. It's also my number four. Really? <laughs> yeah. 
High five, David. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, I feel like you are disagreeing. What What do you have for number uh, four? Well, four is where I had Kill Bill. Okay. Heath Late is where I had is, was my number three. <laughs> Heath Late's your number that? three? Yes. Django was not my number four. <laughs> I have Django higher still. Oh, good. Oh, my goodness. I Man, this rewatch of Django, it's so good. Really grabbed me. Oh, my goodness. Mm. And that might be my favorite Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, oh yeah. So, was, so suspicious. He's, he's, his eyes are all over the place watching everything. I love Samuel L. Jackson in this movie. Well, he's the one who really screws it up for everyone, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's those darn kids and their dog. That's who he is in this movie, which is crazy because he looks like the guy who's wearing the ghost mask. <laughs> he's uh he's live action uncle ruckus that's yeah. he's great oh yeah he's live action uncle ruckus he's even got the same like without the reverse rivitiligo yeah without that part i will say with django unchained i mean it's our second introduction to christoph waltz in quentin tarantino and it's just as good it's pretty good it's just not of the same caliber as our first introduction to him yeah and, but that's my only gripe with it. But man, this movie has flow. Its pacing is amazing. The intro's dope. Some of the most iconic fight and brutal scenes you can imagine. And Leo kills it in this movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, the soundtrack, too. The soundtrack's like Soundtrack's awesome. incredible. Jamie Foxx is also amazing in this movie. Jamie Foxx is always amazing. And that's what <laughs> they're like. I don't know. I feel like he's in a lot of not great movies, but Jamie Foxx always does a solid job. He's like a yeah. very talented dude. And I, the combination, well, not sp- amazing Spider-Man too. <laughs> <laughs> Was there really anything good about amazing Spider-Man? <laughs> <laughs> no, he got you. <laughs> what about uh, mother effort Jones in game night? No, that, not even oh, game that, night in uh, horrible oh, bosses. Man. That's funny, dude. <laughs> yeah, he's he's knocking funny. it out of the park. He's nailing that yeah. thing. <laughs> it's not a huge role for him, but he's nailing that role. <laughs> um, and I feel like the comedy duo that is Christoph Waltz and Jamie Foxx together in this situation, so and good. they are both the straight man, makes it so funny, dude. Like yeah. they, It's so enjoyable watching them go back and forth. When, uh, when Broomhilda passes out and, and Christoph Waltz hits him, <laughs> With you, silver tongue devil. <laughs> yeah, that is really good. Oh, you know, this might be a good time to bring this up, too. This is the Apollo City Comics crossover right here. Hey! But I have had, for a long time, the complete Django Unchained comic book. It's seven issues. Um, and I finally, like, read them in preparation for this episode because this is based on the first draft screenplay of Django. So it's everything. Stuff that's been cut out, stuff that was never even filmed. And it's not worth reading. So, uh, whatever. <laughs> is it much like the Sons of Anarchy comic book? <laughs> well, no, it's it's literally word for word the comic. Oh my god! <laughs> or, or the movie, you know what I mean? But and I just told Brandon this yesterday on the episode, so I guess Frank probably heard this while he was editing. But um, there, the only thing they add is that Broomhilda was purchased by another man before Calvin Candy. This guy who's just like a mama's boy and his mom even knows that he'll never get a woman. So his rich family decides to buy him a black woman to be like his social partner, quote unquote. And we also learn that Calvin Candy has this exclusive nightclub that you have to pay membership to. And it's all these rich Southern gentlemen with their black girlfriends. You know what I mean? And they can only hang out there. Like in slave times but it's very dark or like really hot because of all the candles well just think of um just think of red dead 2 when you go down yeah. to uh that first city what is that place uh the baton rouge looking place or yeah whatever. it's supposed to be nolens whatever that place yeah is. Allen. Uh, you, you gotta you gotta think about that oh, but i can't remember the name of it but then calvin candy like is in a poker match with this guy and sees Broomhilda and he's like interested in her. He's infatuated with her so he tricks this guy into betting her in a poker hand that he cheats at supposedly and then you know takes her and and that's really the biggest thing that's in this book everything else is exactly how it is in the movie maybe a couple extra lines here and there but it's just it's bad because when you read the words you're like man christoph waltz like really elevated this material or like when you when you're reading just the guy who's leonardo dicaprio when you're reading calvin candy you're like 
well, man, I just I want to see Leo just perform this. I don't want to yeah. just like read it on a page. What is this? So it's cool if you're just like a big nerd, but um, it's not worth. Uh, I don't. I mean, just watch the movie. I would say. I just I felt like I had to bring that up because it's like we don't get a lot of extended cuts of Tarantino movies. There's a few, but that's kind of the extended cut of Django. So, <laughs> um, well, Frank, I, I'm not opposed to moving Django up a space. But the real question is, what's everyone's number three? Because I'm willing to entertain moving something down to move Django up. I'm just saying. Django's great. Uh, my number three is Reservoir Dogs. My number three is Pulp Fiction. Mm, interesting. And this is where I'd feel okay moving either one of those down because those movies were way towards the bottom of my list. Oh, oh man. my goodness. <laughs> Whew. Hot. Searing take. Okay. I know. I'll take one for the team, guys. Let's move takes- Reservoir Dog, Reservoir Dogs to number four, if everyone's okay, okay with that. Yeah, I, with that. Okay. I resonate. And man, Reservoir Dogs. I mean, I feel like this is the movie we have to talk about the least because I feel like it's impossible not to see it, and we've already talked about it a whole bunch. But yeah, we yeah, it, it's his first, you know, his, his first full outing. Um, I've I've learned that he'd actually written a few screenplays, like he'd already written Natural Born Killers. And had already written from *Dust Till Dawn*, um, but this was his first time like making his own movie, um, and it's just great, man. And we we get introduced to the cast that shows up for the rest of these movies, like everyone just Except keeps for coming Buscemi. back. Except It's so sad that Buscemi hasn't been in another one. He's got the small little chunk in *Pulp Fiction*. I was gonna yeah. say he's in *Pulp Fiction*, yeah, but that's all that counts. Um, when Tarantino wraps it up with his tenth feature film. Which might be confusing because we we're listing 10 films, but Tarantino counts Kill Bill as one thing. But he said he's going to stop after 10. I hope 10, like, he's got to bring everyone. I know that'd be crazy. Yeah, but the whole crew. It's, it's he's like, got, he's, I was going to say, like, he's got to go all out. It's in game. You know what I mean? It's yeah. the end game of the Tarantino universe. we got to see everybody. <laughs> Let's hopefully skip Captain Marvel film. I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Reservoir Dogs, number four. Number three. Django? Okay. So I was cool with me. Putting Django at number three. I had Django at two. I just want to go on record in that. That's okay. where Django fell for me. Okay. But are we okay with putting Django at number three? Yeah, it's an amazing film. He he's the man that oh sorry. <laughs> One of my uh, favorites. God, the reveal of Django coming out in that blue ruffly suit. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's so gross. <laughs> I love the um. I think one of my favorite scenes, non-violent scenes in the movie, and it's very early on, is our introduction into Chris Fa- Christoph Waltz with yeah. sheriff and the marshal in that little town. And at the end of that whole spill of him just like ruining this dude's day, just like you, know, <laughs> you owe me two hundred dollars. He just shoots the sheriff. He's yeah. like, I asked for the marshal. <laughs> Now you can get the marshal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like very explicit in his setup. Yeah. Make sure you get the sheriff. This isn't a matter for the marshal. Um, yeah, Christoph Waltz, man. What a what a killer. Okay, so number two, and I feel like it has to land here, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Because I'm assuming I all know what our number one is. I don't know if anyone's got another curveball. But only because we've talked about this before. Yeah. Um, okay, so number two, Pulp Fiction. I think the movie that like cemented him as an icon like reservoir dogs was like the weird experimental film and then pulp fiction like changed movies you know what i Man, mean like, pulp fiction is a weird film though it really it's, is it's such a weird film to be considered criterion at least for me i think it's like if you are into movies at all you have to watch yeah. pulp fiction i don't know if pulp fiction's in the criterion collection it probably should be i don't think there's any Tarantino movies in the Criterion Collection, That's which is a damn shame. Just criminal. Um, there is maybe it's more like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, where like people think it should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but it shouldn't be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. If you're watching this on YouTube, I do have this thing, Tarantino XX. It's like his 20th uh, anniversary collection, but most of these are like touched up a little bit. Um, although Tarantino doesn't really like mess with his movies. It's, it's just a bunch of Blu-ray copies with like real good audio quality. So I don't know. I would, I would recommend that if you're going to buy them. Although I think we were talking about this. They're like all on Netflix right now. So if you're listening oh, to this podcast. Huh? That changed very recently. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no. In the, in the very near past, they were 
like almost all on Netflix. Um, but now I think it's only Hateful Eight, The Extendeds, and I think Inglorious Bastards. Django is on Netflix. And Django. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Okay. Well, is there anything you guys want to say about Pulp Fiction? I don't know. Is it- I mean, it's near and dear to me because it actually was my first intro to Tarantino. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, it, it was just kind of changed my outlook on on what I didn't know what a film could be like in, in that way. It also was like one of my first introductions to like, uh, what's the word for it? Like, not like parallel storytelling. Oh, in a non-linear narrative. Story? Uh, yeah, non-linear. Yeah, non-linear. And then it's also multiple perspectives, you know, of the same event happening. Uh, cast is amazing. It's super stylistic. Um, it's got that one song. That, Fantastic. Yeah. Girl, bow, 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 bow. You'll be a woman soon. Sexy. <laughs> um, I so for me, like I saw Reservoir Dogs. Um, I think I was like a freshman in high school. My brother had had it on DVD, and he was like, "You got to watch this movie." And I watched it, and then I had watched it like thirty times. You know what I mean? Like that year. And then I was at school, and I must have been a sophomore. And I had this friend Bobby, who was also an orchestra a little bit older than me and he was chatting about Pulp Fiction one day and about how cool Pulp Fiction was and I was like oh I've never seen Pulp Fiction I've only seen Reservoir Dogs but I really like that movie and this Tarantino right and he was like yeah wait you haven't seen Pulp Fiction and he was like I haven't seen Reservoir Dogs and I was like what and then, so you then <laughs> exactly. he kissed on the cheek well no we just like hung out one Saturday and we just watched both back to back that's a was, good Saturday. That is a good Saturday. Right? And I was just like mind blown. But like exactly what Danny's talking about. We had never seen a movie with a story told that way, but like almost no one had. And that was the groundbreaking thing about it. Like when that movie came out in the nineties, everyone was like, what is going on? This is, this is incredible. Um, I do have one little behind the scenes story that I thought was hilarious because John Travolta was Tarantino's favorite actor at the time. Um, <laughs> him and there was like a some people in Hollywood who thought he was just like the most talented man at the time but after Saturday Night Fever and like all the disco stuff had kind of died down a little bit like he was already kind of getting thrown under like he was kind of like a has-been he was like Leonardo DiCaprio in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood hey, so, hey. Pulp Fiction before or after Michael um, before Actually, I'm pretty sure yeah Michael's like 93 right Okay, I think so I think and I'm pretty so. sure Pulp Fiction's 90 well I think Pulp Fiction's 93 or 94 or something. I don't know. We have I think to it's it 94. Dan is usually spot on. While you continue with your, your little excerpt. Okay. Pulp Fiction 94, Michael 93. All right. Michael 96, Pulp Fiction 94. Ooh. Anyways, um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> uh, he loved Travolta and he wanted to get him in a movie. He wanted to give him a role that was you know, going to revitalize his career. So Travolta agreed to meet with Quentin Tarantino and apparently Tarantino had like board games of properties that he was a part of. So he had like a welcome back Cotter board game. Oh and my the God. first time they met, it was like Tarantino being like, I'm such a big fan. Like, will you play this board game with me? So him and John Travolta were playing a board game that like featured John Travolta. And apparently it was like, not the only one. It was like multiple board games. And I just thought this was like the weirdest story I'd ever heard. Like Tarantino's <laughs> such a weird guy, dude. Yeah. I love when you see a press junket. It's like him, Margot Robbie, Brad Pitt, and Leo. They're like all sitting on a couch together. And the other three of them are just like, this guy's weird. <laughs> like, we love Tarantino. He's made us a lot of money, but this dude is like super strange. It looks so, <laughs> un- look so uncomfortable next to him in real life. It's really funny. What's the consensus there, Frank? Before we get to the obvious reveal of number one, because if you're keeping track at all and you know this list, you know what's coming next. Pulp Fiction was in 1994. But Michael was also in 1996. Oh, you got it. Oh, right on the spot. I got you on the first episode, Danny. Yeah. Here's a, here's a little bit of a, a nostalgia trivia for me. Uh, I remember being young and going to uh, Hollywood Video or Blockbuster. And every time I'd want, I'd pick up Pulp Fiction, I'd be like, Mom, can we get this one? And I mean, my mom was doing her due diligence and saying no, but like, particularly, I remember seeing like the, the font. I was like, this is really interesting. And then also seeing 
Uma Thurman on the front, and I was just like, this is really interesting. <laughs> I'm very interested now. <laughs> I was like, why won't my mom let me watch this movie? <laughs> For good reason, man. That, that cover is beautiful, though. There's something very artistic about it. Yeah, it's a great cover. <sighs> Pulp Fiction. Well, everyone, here we are, number one. And and no drum roll necessary. It's Inglorious Bastards. Inglorious Bastards. As teased upon on our World War II podcast, which you can watch. Uh, listen yeah. to it on and your I, favorite I, listening platform. I like claimed it as my favorite on that episode. And I really thought it was going to change, but it, it, hasn't. it hasn't guys. I got to say, as soon as I wrote this down on paper, the glorious bastard stayed at number one. I didn't even shift to that. Yes. Yeah. It was the first one I wrote down on the page. I was like, I'm, fr- I'm sure about this. And then I'll fill that's in the rest. I did my last and my first, like first, like those were all set. Yeah. And that's where those two stayed. <laughs> So I, I got to say about Inglorious Bastards, just a hypothesis. I think that this one also is so important to us because this was like our first movie as young adults. This was our Tarantino movie. Like if you were like 19 or 20 when Pulp Fiction came out, there's probably no way that any other Tarantino movie would ever beat out that feeling. But something about being like a young man and watching like Inglorious Bastards, right? Like in theaters, you know what I mean? I think I think there is some kind of uh, nostalgic connection that maybe we're a little bit biased, but that's okay. And I don't know if you guys agree with me, but I was just this think 2009 or 2008? 2009. Yeah, 2009. Um, so it was like our senior year of high school. You know what I mean? That's, that's 18 a, years old. That's a cool time. I can go. I can go see R-rated movie without my. I can smoke a to cigarette see. on my way to do it. Yeah, I'm gonna get my scratch off. You're like it was exciting times, <laughs> man. Don't get started about scratch offs. I don't get right <laughs> But now. also, I mean, if even if you, I think if you think about what the hype was before it, it's like, hey, Tarantino's doing this movie about World War II. It's like, okay, I'm sorry, Tarantino's doing a World War II movie. Have to have to see. Amazing. And then it's 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 really his first western. It is a World War II movie, but it's it's in a style of a Western. Um, and, and then we get all the great Westerns after this too from him. But, uh, and we said this last podcast, but man, just the start of the movie, it's like <sighs> it's maybe so his good. best scene he's ever made. Christoph um, Waltz, man. Yeah. This is the best Christoph Waltz role. Oh yeah. He was nominated for best, um, not best actor. What was it? Um, best performance. Supporting. Not, best supporting actor. He, Christoph Waltz has been nominated for best supporting actor twice both for Tarantino roles and he's won both times. So like those two movies he did, he just got the Oscars and it was like his first, his first U S release. You know what I mean? How crazy just to show up and be like, all right, give me the Oscar. Oh, thank you very much. And his the Oscar other, speech is like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's upset. He's the like, that's movie. the one I skipped. <laughs> the movie just has like, we were talking about the tension and hateful eight, but this movie is sublime for tension. Mm. Like the tension is just, it's it, it's funny in its most funny moments. It's scary and tense, but the, I mean, just like the drama and the intensity and in all of it is like just peak. Mm-hmm. It's amazing, and the comedy is rock solid. It's so good. Yeah, <laughs> the violence is amazing. <laughs> oh yeah, talk about some ultra violence. We get some good. Them you get to see <laughs> yeah hamburger meat. Mm. Uh, them punching dudes with bullets and and they just die too they're like not even thinking about leaving they're just down oh. to be shooting nazis yep i'll shoot nazis until i can't <laughs> shooting into the crowd yeah this, that's insane and it's it's awesome because those nazis are dead you know what i mean they will be dead in like five minutes but mm, gotta shoot some nazis i still remember the roar of the crowd when hitler was turned into spaghetti meat oh yeah in the theater, I was just like, this is amazing. It was just like shock. It was like, what is going on right now? <laughs> oh, man, dude. Uh, incredible. I'm glad we were all on the same page with that. And yeah, that's he, exciting. One last thing, too. I heard that they th- this interviewer had asked Tarantino, like, what has been the biggest reaction to any of your movies? And he's like, the biggest reaction to any of my movies was in Glorious Bastards when we premiered it in Berlin. And we premiered it in Tel Aviv. He oh said, like, God. people in Israel, like, lost their minds. They thought it was, like, the coolest movie of all time. That's Good crazy. Crazy. And I was like, that's awesome. And it's cool because this is, like, the first time Tarantino is lifting up uh, a group of people and, like, giving them a champion, even if it's not real. You know what I mean? But that's, like, what Django is, too. Mm-hmm. It's like, here's American slavery and how terrible and disgusting it is. And let me create, like, a superhero 
like for this setting. Um, I think it's super cool, man. It's amazing. Yeah. And I just another side point. I had seen this YouTube video, and I can't shout out the channel because this was years ago. This is like when Inglorious Bastards came out. Of this, the 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 person on this channel was theorizing that like in the Tarantino universe, because it is one big universe. Red Apple cigarettes exist and everything. This is like his world that we're in. Mm-hmm. Um, like the World War II was ended in this really super violent way. They like burned all the Nazi leaders and like mashed Hitler's face into hamburger bits, and that's how you finish World War II. And those were like the heroes of World War II. They like saved the world, and that's why like this universe is so ultra violent. That's interesting like, because there's like a um, a better feeling about violence than we have in this actual universe. And I just thought that was a really interesting uh, theory. I think that's a really interesting point. And I, I had also heard like another kind of theory that some of the movies in Tarantino's universe are movies. So like Inglorious Bastards would be a movie that the characters in Pulp Fiction would go to see. You hmm. know what I mean? And in a weird way, that kind of makes sense too. Cause then we watch once upon a time in Hollywood and that movie that DiCaprio was in looked straight up like Inglorious Bastards. So like it yeah. looked something like right out of it. Um, I don't know, man, there's so many cool theories about Tarantino because he leaves all these tiny little connections between all of them, um, which is, yeah, I don't know. It's super cool, man. It, it, it keeps Tarantino. diving in. Great at universes and storytelling and characters and love and feet and love and feet and, and, love and feet. at it being around other people. <laughs> I still love that quarantine, uh, that quarantino, that Tarantino meme where he's just straight up in his house, just looking around all frumpy at <gasps> yeah. every part of his house. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> um, I do got to point out, there's just a couple things that we didn't touch on. Uh, first, we didn't do any of the movies that Tarantino just wrote, like True Romance or um, what's the other one? Natural Born Killers. Natural Born Killers. Natural Born Killers is way better than True Mor- Romance, I think. Yeah. Um, I love both of those movies in very different ways. Mm, I can see that. I mean, I don't think either of those are bad. I don't like From Dust Till Dawn. Um, nah, me either. But some people really love that movie. I don't love it. I like it. If it's on, I'll watch it. I'll be like, then, yeah. <laughs> we also, we don't have Four Rooms, which is a movie that's made of four different scenes, each one done, or sorry, four different sections, each one done by a different director. And Tarantino does the last one. And it's all these eccentric people who are in this, uh, or staying in this hotel. And Tim Roth is the bellboy. And uh, Bruce Willis is the main character of the last segment. Um, It was like after Pulp Fiction. It's not very good. So (laughs) like I've watched it. We, I watched it with Michelle one time and we were like, let's just skip ahead to the Tarantino one. Cause this like, we watched the first segment and then like halfway in the second segment, I was like, let's not do this. And then we, when we got to the fourth segment, it was like, this isn't even that great. So what happened? But while researching Tarantino, I did discover a few other things. He has a short film called my best friend's birthday, which I uh, was watching. It's on YouTube. Um, it features a DJ named K Billy, which is funny because that's the DJ in Reservoir Dogs. K Billy super sounds the seventies. Um, <laughs> it's in black and white. I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, it's like 30 something minutes long, but you guys might be interested in checking that out. Very um, he also did an episode of ER in 1995 weird right after the pulp fiction hype they i guess you know they're tossing out offers so he did a guest spot on er like as a director he didn't write the episode but he just directed it i haven't seen that but i did watch last night his two episode run on csi <laughs> yeah! How was that? no i'm just joking um uh csi it was great he writ he wrote and directed two episodes of csi it's the season finale of uh season five it's like a two-parter. And if you guys watch CSI, if you remember Nick, um, kind of the younger one, not but like in the middle, he's got like daddy issues. He wishes Grisham was like his dad. Um, Nick is kidnapped by some maniac and buried alive underground in a coffin. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but then um, – they have it like set up. There's like a webcam and they send the video to the CSI. So they get to see Nick trapped in this box and there's like a little button for them to turn on the light so they can see him. But every time they press the button, 
the vents shut off and he can't get any air but there's oh, no wow. audio so they can't communicate any of this he doesn't even know what's going on oh my um, gosh and then it's just like you have 12 hours to give me a million dollars or he dies it's like straight up saw or something do you want to play a game um and apparently tarantino's just like i love csi <laughs> and then the csi guys heard about it and then william patterson was like or william peterson was like let me reach out the dad from fear in case you don't remember and then he's like uh would you want to direct and write an episode of CSI? And he's like, I'm down, I'm down, I'm down. And then he showed up and apparently everyone on set was just like blown away. They were like, what's going on? We're working with Quentin Tarantino right now. This is That's like awesome. Network television. Right? That's just insane. So it's on Hulu. Highly recommend the last two episodes of season five of CSI. <laughs> I just watched that tonight. You guys should. Um, and there's so many Kill Bill references. There are so many Kill Bill references because it's right after Kill Bill came out. So ah, okay. You'll see a lot of love for Kill Bill. It's really cool. That's a tasty tidbit. Well, I think it's time for our next segment. All right. This is our new segment called Character Limit Extended, the movie review segment where we didn't finish enough on Character Limit Exceeded. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's so so succinct. That's perfect. (laughs) That's right. So essentially, we have our Character Limit Extended, which is now, but uh, it branches off of Character Limit Exceeded, where we are limited to certain amounts of characters. In in this segment, we're just going to talk a little bit about our last reviewed film, what we thought about it, and. uh, We don't have a limit on our characters. Yeah. So in in case you missed it, it's on our YouTube channel. We did a video review of Downfall. And uh, Frank, did you have anything else about Downfall that you wanted to share in this extended conversation? Well, I feel like I'm going to have the least to say because I had the most to say on our review (laughs) uh, with the book report. Um, I mean, not really. I feel like I said everything I needed to say about this (laughs) I mean, it, it was a very con- concise little, everybody acted fantastically. There wasn't any buddy's part that I had a problem with in anybody in any way. Like I felt like everybody's delivery was, was a okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Wunderbar, if you will. There you go. I feel conflicted because I did Italian with German. <laughs> Wunderbar. <laughs> Those nations would appreciate that. I think. No, I mean, why don't, why don't you guys go? I got it all out. I was going to say, you know, I went into this movie not knowing a thing about it. I had seen it from, you know, the memes and gifs of Hitler going crazy, uh, which are great. But I I, I think it was right about the 20 minute mark or so in this movie. This movie is pretty long, but it, it definitely flows. It's like at that point I realized, oh, this is what this movie is about. Okay, this is the 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 way that this one's gonna go because i was just like okay it's another world war ii movie i don't know oh it's all in german okay interesting and then i was like oh okay this is about a slow descent into madness uh actually not even slow it's 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 pretty quick it picks up it's a lot like watching water go down a drain (laughs) oh that's good you know when i was i was talking with michelle i was like this is like when you're playing monopoly and there's only two people left (laughs) and that one guy just keeps going around the board even though he owns two properties and it's, it's like whatever space he's going to land on, he's going to be bankrupt. That's like what watching this movie is like because Hitler is just in denial about his odds. And every time he's like, well, we can count on these guys over here. And then oh, Hitler, uh, we, had, we had to retreat. Uh, the, men, the men had no, no more bullets. Um, or they're dead. Or they're yeah. all dead. Um, I love like a quarter way through the movie when he's like, you guys think like I'm screwed but I'm a genius yeah. <laughs> like, we're gonna come and trap them. And like the hardcores are like, nah, this guy's lost it. But the ladies are like, ah, thank you, Papa Hitler. Like, yeah. and then like days later, they're like, Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing seeing like what usually happens in like a movie about a cult being like projected onto the whole nation and essentially mm-hmm. like half of the world at that point. It's just crazy seeing it happen. And so many people, doubting him until the end and I, and like Goebbels being like on his side up until like the end essentially yeah. not realizing how crazy he was and i gotta say the actor that played Goebbels is terrifying yeah like <laughs> he looks scary he looks that just- guy's face is just like that 
Like if you were just walking out in public, like in the dark on your own and you turned a corner and that's the face you met, you would audibly scream and you would like jump. Like, oh, it's might- like, he's got a face on his face. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, <laughs> he's got extra face in his face. Sometimes he probably does. And then, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying, sometimes he probably does. Yeah. <laughs> just like, looks like he's mid transformation into a vampire from dust till dawn. Oh my god! Oh wow, you're right though. Yeah, the yeah the, the temples like, come out and all the sunken eye kind of thing. Yep. Uh, I I just thought too. I was like, man, these four Gerbils children. How close are they to being like the Sound of Music children? But this Aww. got so backwards. Oh, those poor little chitlins, man. And I don't think Michelle had known that about history. Like, she wasn't familiar with that part of the story. So, like, when I saw those little kids show up, I was like, I know exactly what's going to happen to these little kids. Um, But, yeah, she was, like, taken aback a little bit. Um, I do have to say that is one thing. I didn't get to fit this into my review. But I feel like you need to know basic world – not even basic World War II history. You need to know, like, intermediate World War II history to get this movie because they – depth. They don't, and I, I think it's part because it's a German movie. So I think in Germany, it is like they understand their own history. Yeah. But this is part that you don't really teach in American schools. Yeah, uh, you got to dig a little bit. Yeah, yeah it's like it's, not even World War II in color will give you some of this stuff. Because yeah. yeah, even what they tell you in school, it's like okay, well, you you hear about all the atrocities, and you're just like, okay, well, how did it end? And they're just like, well, Hitler committed suicide, and it's just like, oh anticlimactic yeah and I, I remember hearing that too like oh hitler killed himself in a bunker history you're like cars. <laughs> okay but that, yeah it doesn't really explain the full aspect of what's going on i think it's a i think it's a really important movie that if you were like getting into world war ii and learning about it and maybe you would only seen everything from one side of the conflict i think it does teach an important lesson that like we can't say that in a war this entire country is evil like right. there are good people who are just swept up into a situation or, or they're tricked or they're, you know, um, but I think it's just an important thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we can't, we can't act like people just aren't people. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, I think that was one interesting side of it was that like seeing the perspective of the town folk who know what's going on that are trying to save the the children that are indoctrinated into it. You know what I mean? I, my favorite, my favorite relationship in that movie is the little boy. And and you had made a comment when we were talking about it about it being kind of like Jojo Rabbit, and it sort of is. There's like it is. There's this brainwashed little boy who's like a little Nazi, and his dad is like, "What are you doing?" Because he they they have kids running the anti like the anti tank guns and stuff because they're running out of soldiers. Yep. And he's like, "You guys know when the Russians show up, they're gonna kill you." It doesn't matter mm-hmm. if you're a little kid. If you're shooting at them, they're going to kill you. There's like, no way you're making it out of this situation. Like, leave yeah. now or die. Yeah. Um, and it's also cool. I feel like, man, Russians don't get enough love in World War II movies. So I'm always stoked. And then especially at the end, they're doing, a little, doing some, like, Korobushka dancing going on. I'm like, yes, man. This oh, is, yeah, those boys this, were having a good time. I had never rooted for Ru- Russians like I had <laughs> when they were storming Germany. Yeah, for reals. Or Rocky Three. you know what I mean? Because like, you're tied to <laughs> Sylvester Stallone by that point. Uh, hot take. Hot take. Hot take. <laughs> but I think, yeah, that that was my favorite part of the, the whole going on was, like, the, the way that the kids were indoctrinated and seeing how the town folks – reacted to the madness happening but also just <laughs> the bunker is just the best part of the movie everything that yeah. happens in the bunker is just incredible and especially oh man how it, it's like it's coming to a close and it like comes in on the guy who's like the communications guy i guess that's left over in the bunker and like every every like people are dropping like flies like every 20 seconds you just hear like bam <laughs> and it's all quiet in the bunker <laughs> And Goebbels just comes up to this poor guy that's running the radio. He's just like, I don't need you anymore. And then he's like, what? And he's just quiet. And he just walks him go into the, the bunker. Just bam. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Some people are just there like quietly doing their work. <laughs> and some soldiers are just drunk. Like the entire oh, yeah. time. Like, oh, yeah, man. Like, last, last days of Rome, dude. Michelle and I said the same thing. We like turned to each other. And we were like, last days of Rome. <laughs> Like the denial so awesome. The the scene where uh, Ava Braun goes out to uh, smoke oh, yeah. for the ladies. And then they're like a couple minutes into their cigarettes and then bombs start dropping like real close. And she's like, <laughs> let's go back inside. Or when they go to the party where Ava just wants to party and like they go to like a dance hall and everyone's going crazy. And then a freaking artillery shell just like breaks through the dancer. Yeah. Dude, I knew this 
audio was going to be dope. So instead of playing it through my TV, which for some reason doesn't have an audio out, I like streamed it through my laptop, ran my TV as the monitor, and I was running the audio out of my studio monitors. And, ooh, that bomb in particular, like ooh, I had like goosebumps. It was so bassy and beautiful. Ooh, that's a smart idea, Frank. I'm oh, jelly right now. My godness. My godness. My, my good- godness. <laughs> my godness. <laughs> Uh, oh, fantastic. Well, um, unless you guys have anything else to say about Downfall, I think it's time for... Oh, that's interesting. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, if you if you like listen to We Did a Podcast, and, and we're going to... I mean, the episodes will always be on YouTube, but I'm sure we're going to find some way to keep some of them. I don't know what we're going to do, really. But... Uh, Oh, that's interesting is our current event segment, and we, we carried it over. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to bring this up. I don't know if you guys knew about this, but basically over the last year, Quentin Tarantino has been in talks to direct a Star Trek movie. I have heard this. I've heard this. Yeah. Was it the, a year? Has it been since like 2017? I think they were trying Maybe. to figure out the new trilogy kind of thing. Well, they were talking about him picking up and doing like oh. the fourth movie of the wow. same cast of Star Trek characters. Um, apparently he's just like a, a pretty big Star Trek fan, but I brought this up because it just happened uh, like at the beginning of this year. Apparently he has dropped it. He, he has been oh. attached to an R rated Star Trek movie for well over a year, but in a new interview, he doubts that he'll move on the, uh, the project because he's committed to doing a 10 film plan before uh, retiring from directing, which oh. means he, he only has one left, and I think he doesn't want to spend it on a Star Trek movie. That's interesting. Fair. Yeah, I do remember hearing that hubbub about like him taking this on as his last movie. You know, people were just like, "Oh, come on, really? Like, we need that that final send off in the Tarantino verse, really, rather than Star Trek." Yeah, I think it would be really divisive. And I think it would be divisive among Star Trek fans, too. And I'm not a Star Trek fan. Yeah, I'm not. I, I, I've tried. I've given my best. But I'm, you know, I'm a Star Wars guy. Yeah. It's, just, it's in my blood. Let's say We've just lost half of our listeners now. <laughs> I'm a, if Trekkies, they can leave. Yeah, yeah, if you're Trekkies, you can get out. The nerds. door is uh, that way. <laughs> um, uh, also not a Star Trek fan, but those new movies are enjoyable. <laughs> they good. are. Enjoyable. I heard the third one's really good, and I just haven't seen it yet. Same. I think I've seen the two. I've seen two. And the second one is great when they reveal – well, spoiler alert, they reveal Khan. <laughs> Khan! I was gonna, yeah, there we go. Thank you. I was going <laughs> to shout it. but um, I wanted to Benedict read Cumbersnatch does a great job. <laughs> I wanted to read this one quote from him. He says, one of the, and imagine I'm Tarantino reading this. One of the things that Hollywood has done is that it's made me feel like I've made my big statement on Hollywood and that there is an accumulation of a career accumulation of my interest accumulation of the filmography if the idea that all the films are a boxcar and it's all one train they're all telling one story well this is the climax so i can actually see now my 10th movie probably being a little smaller what i don't know what that means i think maybe he's spread out so far like he's taken on some huge genres maybe it's going to be super focused Hmm. for the last movie but I don't know exactly what that could be. Who knows, well, man? That last bit is not just interesting, but it is intriguing. Oh, thank you. I am honestly going to say if I could if I could desire for him to do something, it would just be something that's an ensemble, small, you know, small set like we're doing with Hateful Eight, but just like all of the people that just blasted his career off. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be really cool, man. Um, he just like, it's a bunch of like concerned moms or something. Um, I also have a list for you as like a bonus. Interesting. These are movies that Tarantino had considered and then abandoned uh, a Luke Cage movie in the mid nineties starring Lawrence Fishburne. Interesting. That'd have been cool. A remake of Westworld from producer Joe Silver, Dang. which would have starred Arnold Schwarzenegger. Dude, I think that would have been really cool with Tarantino on Westworld. And, and this was before Westworld was revived as a show. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this would have been just a remake of that older movie. A reboot of The Man from Uncle, which also happened and everyone just forgot about. That's an okay movie. It, it, had, it had Superman in it. Yeah. Um, oh, I feel like I've never heard of that. 
Green <laughs> Lantern. Terrible. You know what? I actually watched it the other night with Michelle. Which one? Green Lantern. How oh, Ryan Reynolds? Yeah, because she's seen like almost every Ryan Reynolds movie. And I bought that movie for like 50 cents because I was like, well, one day we're going to have to watch it. It's not as bad as people give it credit for. I mean, it's it's just bland and uninspired. Definitely. But it ain't Captain Marvel bad. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he also had a Tom Cruise vehicle of some description that Tarantino mentioned once in passing. <laughs> I love how vague that is. <laughs> yeah, and then I have a couple more for you. These are things that Tarantino thought would be interesting to do. An original superhero film. A children's movie. A science hmm. fiction film, which maybe is somewhat of the Star Trek desire, but I would love to see Tarantino do space. That yeah. would be crazy. That would be pretty crazy. That's um, one thing he hasn't touched. A screwball romantic comedy. A softcore sexploitation movie. A 70s style disaster, a gangster movie in the 1930s, a film of some sort set in Australia. (laughs) Okay, and then this is the last thing. (laughs) This is um, ideas that have arisen with varying degrees of plausibility. So things that Tarantino has like brought up is like, this would be a cool idea, but then maybe like this would never happen. Um, A film adaptation of crime spy literary franchise, Modesty Blaze a straight to video version of which he ended up executive producing. So he kind of did that. Um, he wanted to do more of the novels that Jackie Brown is based on. Cause Jackie Brown's based on a novel and he wrote the screenplay. Huh. Um, but apparently a lot of those characters show up again. So he, he would, uh, was interested in doing that. Um, an adaptation of Brett Easton Ellis's debut novel, less than zero. This would be like a dream come true. Cause that's like one of my favorite novels of all time. I don't know uh, if I'm familiar. Brett Easton Ellis is the guy who wrote American Psycho. Um, oh. And he's just as weird and douchey as Tarantino. So I feel like they, with their powers combined, <laughs> they could do something incredible. Um, they would on to Less Than Zero, and I could see that being quite delightful. Right? It'd be really good. And then a rumored but denied remake of Faster Pussycat Kill Kill starring Britney Spears. Weird. Weird. And then this is just a tidbit for you all. And I'm reading this from, it's like a Tarantino magazine that I bought at Alamo Draft House when Once Upon a Time in Hollywood came out. But this last part, he says, finally, a film that would deal with Tarantino's favorite American who ever lived, John Brown, who helped kickstart the abolitionist movement in the 1850s by killing five supporters of slavery. He later commanded troops in a key battle that led to the American Civil War and was hanged in Virginia as the first American ever convicted of treason. A controversial figure throughout history, with various accounts depicting him as a hero or a terrorist, Brown seems like the perfect subject material for Tarantino. Interesting. Wouldn't that make an interesting last movie? Hmm. David, that is interesting. Took the words right out of my mouth. I'm glad. Frank, what do we got next? Up next, for the first time ever on Uninformed Movie Reviews, we got peeps and predicts, y'all. For those of us us and (laughs) you that are unfamiliar with this segment, we have a jar of peeps, which is short for people. They are in pairs. Uh, They can be fictional. They can be real. Who knows? And in the other jar, we have a bunch of predicts, which is short for predicaments will be something they can face off or overcome. And we're going to see who can do it better or sometimes worse is how some of these work out. So let's see what we got. Today for our peeps, we have two famous groups. We have the gang from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia versus the gang from Scooby-Doo. That's amazing. (laughs) That's fun. And their first predicament that they find themselves in. Let me get the audio in here. Authentic. Who would collect more Nazi scalps? Oh, man. The Uh, gang collects Nazi scalps. (laughs) Dude, I've seen Charlie bite Santa in the throat. (laughs) (laughs) This this one's all this one's simple because the Scooby (laughs) gang is going to cause violence against anybody, even Nazis. 
And I've never seen Scooby handle a knife, but he probably can't hold down somebody and skin them. I don't know. As well as thumbs would. Yeah, the, the thumbs are a big part of that. And I uh, feel like Frank would skin a Nazi without even knowing it was a Nazi. He would just yeah. scalp. Sorry, I said skin. <laughs> scalp a Nazi. He'd just be trying to make himself a toupee. <laughs> yeah. With his toe knife. They always have a toe knife. <laughs> That's an easy one. Uh, okay, well, let's yeah, go to round two. Any arguments for this? <laughs> All right, for number two, we have... Who's got sexier feet, everyone? Oh, man. On this Tarantino-themed <laughs> Peeps and Predicts. I'll open this argument up. <laughs> Dennis is the golden god. He is the golden god, and we know Charlie... Yeah, got those bird feet. He's a five-star man. <laughs> Charlie, at least we know he at least maintains his feet. So does Danny DeVito. He's got the toe uh, knife. He's got the toe knife. Danny DeVito Ooh. does take care of his feet, but they are probably like all cut up and, and infected. <laughs> God. Yeah, just Danny DeVito without the toe knife was probably already bringing their points way down. <laughs> but then, like, Danny DeVito, <laughs> like, cutting his foot Take off around under dirty his knife. <laughs> okay, just so this isn't creepy, can we just go with the live action cast of Scooby Doo? Because I don't oh. want to talk about cartoon people's. Oh, feet. Weird. weird. So, like, Matthew Lillard and Matthew Lillard, Freddie Prince Jr. Matthew has got some nice feet. I'm just going to go out there. Yeah. And- he looks like he takes care of himself. You're telling me Freddie Prince Jr. doesn't get a pedicure? Is that what you're trying yeah, to say? Yeah, he's right got now? some nice feet. That guy takes care of his feet. And then we got Linda Cardellini, everybody. Ooh. And uh, and uh, Michelle Geller, Sarah Michelle Geller. Oh, is that her? I don't Isn't know that the one that plays Daphne? Is she his wife? Aren't they married? I think they are married, yeah. It's weird because, yeah, they're married and they're also both in Star Wars Rebels. Huh. Weird. Yeah. Um, uh, Freddie Prince Jr. is like one of the main characters. <laughs> huh. And Sarah Michelle Geller plays an inquisitor. They hunt rogue Jedis. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's I would imagine place. they take care of their feet. Lindy Cardellini does take care of her feet. And puppy feet, adorable. Oh, Not, there you go nothing. right there. I want to go on record, though. Nothing sexy about them, but they're so mm. cute. I mean, it was uh, definitely implied, I mean, heavily the, implied. The question was, who's got sexier feet, Frank? So That's why I clarify. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm done. laughs> okay, hey, well, so we're 1-1 then, right? Scooby-Doo gang uh, v. the gang. And just one last argument, even though it's settled, but... I've seen Charlie's underwear just disintegrate from the pool. Yeah. I can't imagine his socks are any better, man. Or his shoes, I don't think he wears socks. Or his feet. Yeah. yeah, he's a he's a shoes without socks kind of guy, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and I, the last one is, who's more likely to have a sequel? Which I got to say is probably Scooby-Doo. Even though Sonny's been super successful and has been on for a long time, Scooby-Doo has been alive since like the 70s. And they just came out with the new movie. They're like, making more. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're not slowing down anytime soon. I, mean, I would say that they've kept going. They've had like direct to DVD and direct to yeah. VHS for kids for like years. Got not a to, pub named Scooby Doo. Yeah, I was gonna say not to mention so many different series. There was like a bunch like the we were like we were already adults and they're still coming up with a brand new series. So, um, Sunny, although it has a long run, it's probably going to be done in the next few years, and then I it'll never be back. Yeah. I thought they said the next one would be the end. I Wouldn't think that, I think they said, but then I I feel like they might have also said like we're gonna do two more. They keep changing it. Hmm. Um, they've been pushing it back for a while. It's impressive how long they've gone. I'm excited to see a quarantine episode. There's gonna be a quarantine episode. Well, there is. Ain't got quarantined already. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, it, and it turns out it's all like alcohol poisoning. <laughs> they're just going through alcohol. No, they're going through alcohol withdrawal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I watched that episode with Michelle not too long ago. I was like, ah, we gotta watch the gang goes into quarantine. This is perfect. And then they order the pizza and everyone like loses it. What? You broke quarantine. If only people treated it like that for real. Okay, so Scooby Doo and the gang up against Rick Sanchez, our reigning champ. Ooh, that's tough. Rick. <laughs> let's, let's see what it is. Who's more likely to get Scooby Snacks? Aw. Who could roll a better red apple cigarette? I mean, Rick. I feel like, well, I don't know. Shaggy, Shaggy and man. Scooby. Scooby Shaggy also. could do an excellent job. But Rick probably has a robot specifically for doing that. And but I bet is, job. is Rick rolling it then if he has a robot to do it? 
Yeah, he's the creator of the thing that is doing it. If you if had, he, what, if he went to a store and bought a machine, I would say no, he bought a machine. But he that machine didn't exist until he made it specifically for that purpose. I would say if that if there's any plausible hmm. universe for to interact with the Quentin Tarantino universe, it would probably be Rick Sanchez because he'd probably create some sort of portal gun hmm. to like get into the Tarantino universe, get red apple cigarettes. I don't know how the gang, the Scooby-Doo gang would be able to interact with red apple cigarettes. I think Scooby-Doo makes way more sense in a Tarantino universe. It's like campy. 70s. It's from the 70s. Um, it's It's got a lot of feet. No, I'm just joking. Um, but Rick is like, there's no science fiction in Tarantino movies. Like, period. Yeah. It's the Star Trek. Yeah, there's, there's zero science fiction. Um, and Rick is too... Um, like fourth wall breaking to be in a Tarantino movie. I don't think I've seen Rick smoke a cigarette either. I was going to say he's a, he's a booze fiend. I've seen him smoke weed, right? I don't. Some kind of crazy space drug, like a space crystal or something. Yeah. But I don't know if I've ever seen him with a cigarette in his mouth. Yeah. Whereas as we know, Shaggy is up to something in the back of that van. I would even say that Scooby could. He's got the munchies all the time. He's making these giant sandwiches that are like, you know, 30 layers. It's ridiculous. And then he's feeding it to his dog, which is just not good. He you can't, can't giving... dog feed people food like that. No way. You're going to hurt Scooby. He's a great Dane. They're sensitive dogs. They yeah, he's already problems. not going to live a long time. That's crazy. Is the saddest part about the Scooby-Doo universe. <laughs> <laughs> which is why they have to keep rebooting it when the dog yeah. dies. <laughs> they just keep getting new dogs and naming them Scooby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Scooby. I don't know, y'all. Um, Has Rick finally met, met his match? I feel like I feel like he wouldn't have. I feel like he would have got away with it too if it wasn't for those pesky kids <laughs> and that darn dog. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every time we have somebody, we're like sure is gonna stay. They're always dethroned by somebody you never expect. It's all about the situation, man. It is. And it's always <laughs> like we curse it too. It's like the episode before. Oh, yeah. he's gonna be here for a while. Oh, never mind. Skin ham or something ridiculous. Um, wow, guys, the gang took it over. Who would have guessed? Okay. Wow. So the Scooby Doo gang is our peeps and predicts champions. And you know what, everyone? Thank you for listening to the first uninformed movie reviews. Let us know uh, if there's a movie you want us to talk about next. We hope you feel informed. Be sure to check out our <laughs> official uninformed list of the best Quentin Tarantino films of all time due to our tastes. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Check out the other content on David and Frankenbeans. Don't forget to check out the Apollo City Comics podcast if you're into that sort of thing. Yeah, just every so while. Every That's right. while. The video just dropped, actually. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to bring up with you guys, just is something that happened in my life recently. I ordered a holster for one of my handguns. Holster showed up. And it came with a pocket version of the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> uh, which I, I thought was a little bit cool. I was like, dope. I'm going to sit down and read this. I might carry it around in my pocket just to be a jerk about it. Just like, bam. When a cop pulls you over or something? <laughs> yes. And then I get tased. Um, but there's one detail to this thing that I think is really funny. On the back, there is a pledge for you to, it's a, I'm just going to read it to you guys. I, as one of we, the people of the United States affirm that I have read or will read our U S constitution <laughs> pledge to maintain and promote its standard of Liberty for myself and for my posterity and hereby attest that be my signature. So there's a line pledger for you to sign a uh, well, pledger, you know, but guys, there's a, it, this isn't just some meaningless thing, you know? This is like a big thing. So there's got to be like a legit witness. And they already went through all the trouble of having somebody pre sign this for me. And wouldn't you know, <laughs> it's our founding father, George Washington. <laughs> the first president. He's your witness? <laughs> yeah, dude. Isn't that cool? <laughs> we went back in time and got George Washington to witness so you. Sign. I thought the back cover of this thing was hilarious. I got a good chuckle to this thing last night. That is so funny. That is I got it. When I got all the way to the back and I was like, oh my God, especially the or <laughs> part of the pledge. Like, I'll get around to it. <laughs> you open the book up and it's like just the second amendment and there's like every, all oh, the other pages are blank. You're like, <laughs> I got to say, Frank, 
I'm okay with you carrying that around, but if you feel like you got to enforce it, I feel like you might be too dark to get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, the, the thing is my racial ambiguity because I have this beard going now too. It's just dangerous. I, I can't be playing games like that. <laughs> I don't think they'll give you enough time for you to show your copy of the Constitution. Yeah. I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> That'll be the end of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 wow what a sad note to end on <laughs> oh man well thanks for listening everybody <laughs> right, get out of here go to your homes <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>